Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Inspirato, provider of the world's most exclusive vacation homes. I just joined Inspirato and I can tell you they go way beyond a typical vacation rental. It's all the best parts of a vacation house. The space, the privacy, the kitchen and dining room, combined with the service you'd expect from a five-star hotel. That means premium linens and furnishings, plus daily housekeeping, an on-site concierge, and much more. It really is the best of both worlds. From Turks and Caicos to Tuscany, you'll find consistent luxury. Right now, our listeners can receive a thousand bucks towards their first trip to one of their exclusive vacation homes when they become an Inspirato member. You can call 310-773-9474 and mention Meb Faber or visit inspirato.com forward slash Meb sent me to learn more. That's inspirato.com forward slash Meb sent me. Welcome podcast listeners. Today we have an awesome show for you. Apologize if I'm a little stuffy. My normal monotone probably sounds even worse today, but our guest today is both the portfolio manager and head of the dynamic allocation strategies team at William Blair. Before his current role, he served as head of investment strategies at Singer Partners and Global Investment Solutions. He is also the America's CIO for UBS Global Asset Management. Prolific writer, having written about global portfolios, currencies, which we'll get into today, and portfolio performance. He's also in the Performance and Risk Management Hall of Fame. We're excited to have him. Welcome to the show, Brian Singer. Thank you very much, man. Good to be here. Brian, you're in Chicago right now. I'm, I'm excited to hopefully meet up with you in, in a week when I head there. You know, I've never... I've been to Chicago, let's call it, I don't know, 20, 30 times. I've never been to Chicago Cubs game. So oh. hopefully they're in town. <laughs> that might be high on my to-do list. But I've scheduled every trip I've ever been there. I have a brother in Downers Grove. So... I schedule every trip somehow. They're they're on a on a road trip, so fingers crossed. Now the weather's good. Hopefully, it sticks for you. Yeah. So you're you know you're a macro guy, which is music to my ears. So a lot of stuff we can get into today. But why don't you start by giving us maybe just kind of a thousand foot level your overall approach or framework is the way we describe it to to the markets in general, and then we'll start to veer off from there. Sure. Overall approach of the team, me and, and, and my team, is fundamental in nature. We look at about 100 different asset markets. So it could be a country market, sectors around the world, about 30 different currencies around the world. Those are the things that we trade. We do not trade individual stocks or bonds on individual companies. These are all broader exposures, diversified exposures, that we have in each of these asset categories. We first take that fundamental view of the opportunities out there where we see mispricing. That's where we begin to do research. The research involves theoretically rigorous, quantitative, qualitative delving into why those opportunities may exist. And then we spend a lot of time focusing on risk management, especially in the world that we live in today regarding downside risk management. So that's pretty much the approach and all our portfolios are macro in nature. We go long short. From the sounds of it, this is like almost like an old school 1970s or 80s macro hedge fund, you know, where it sounds like you have a little bit of a quant process, but also a little bit of a discretionary overlay. And it's going to be a lot of fun because you you don't have as many these days. I feel like the shorts, the short side has been harder for a lot of people. But so let's talk. We read a bunch of your articles and have seen a bunch of your pieces. And you mentioned a lot kind of macro factors that have been pushing around fundamental asset prices. And as we all know, fundamentals certainly work in the long term and one of the best across assets and within assets factors. You mentioned in your pieces, everything from populism and central banks Maybe talk a little bit about macro forces today and kind of what's going on in the world today. What do you what do you think 
some of the the macro forces that influence what y'all have going on in your portfolios? Let me say right out of the chute that uh, as a general rule, as we look around the markets, the equity markets actually do have value. They look attractive. Bonds do not. Sometimes I'm accused of being a pessimist, and I just want to get that that out there on the table with respect to equities. There are a number of factors that we do really kind of focus in on now that are important to us. When we do our our analysis, we set up macro themes and we set up game theaters, macro themes to identify things like populism or energy that may influence assets and currencies around the world. And then game theaters where we want to take a closer look at, for example, trade negotiations or the negotiations or or gaming between Europe and Russia, those types of things. The themes that we're looking at now, populism, I know uh, in in the United States, people think that uh, there's something unique going on here in terms of populism. It's not. We're just perhaps one of the later ones to the game. It has been going on in Europe for quite some time. It affects election outcomes. It affects policies, capital market policies. And it's important for us to know what countries are exposed, what sectors are exposed, and how they're exposed to populism. Another one is energy. In this instance, it involves a couple things. One is in part a game theater focused on the Middle East. And obviously, we have recently here Trump pulling out of the Iran agreement, and that is part of that game theater, which includes Iran, Saudi Arabia, Israel, U.S., etc. But that energy theme also involves considerations of things like fracking and in the natural gas space, the transportation of natural gas, because natural gas is generally a local commodity, uh, but it's increasingly moving toward a global commodity and should see some of those differentials in natural gas prices dissipating. We want to keep track of that in terms of our analysis of what's going on in the energy sector, plus countries around the world, such as Russia or China. We do have one another theme where we focus on Chinese growth. It used to be the case that people would say if the U.S. sneezes, the world catches a cold. However, in this instance, China can sneeze also, and the world can catch a cold. And we have to be cognizant of what's going on there. We particularly focus on it because, one, it's hard to understand what growth actually is. Two, it's from our perspective, it's not only hard to understand it, it's being manipulated across the board, and it becomes much more a behavioral issue than an actual growth issue. And we need to know, especially in Southeast Asia, how markets will ultimately be influenced. Material sector also, energy sector also, for example. Game theaters, we have an Asian game theater there that's really kind of focused on the U.S., China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam. All of the negotiation of trade and South China Sea issues are important considerations there. We have a European Union game theater uh, that focuses on the ECB, the UK, Spain, Italy, France, Germany. That does kind of get a little bit of the populism consideration in it, but not necessarily just populism. It's really their influence in negotiations and things like Brexit or alternatively the application of a broad European Monetary Union central bank policy against what some of the national central banks may want to do. And then in places like Spain and Italy, where there are populist influences relative to what's going on in Germany, how do we actually deal with those? How is how's what's going on in Italy going to affect what's happening in France and Germany, for example? And then the last one I mentioned already was the Middle East Game Theater. And there we're really focused on trying to understand the influence of all the gamesmanship, negotiations, and engagements there on the oil price and what it means for our various positions that are exposed to oil. And that could be currencies as well as just the energy sector. That's kind of what we're looking at, the broad factors. <laughs> That's good. That's a lot. So tell me a little bit about the process. So, you know, your team has been together for a long time and I'm sure y'all have this refined, but it might be useful for the listeners to think about you know, where you say, look, we're, we're kind of driven by fundamentals and for equities and, and bonds, maybe that's, that's valuation and discounted cash flows. And we'll get into currencies later, but maybe talk a little bit about you sit down and you're building this portfolio. And part of it is this fundamental side. And then you start to have these themes and how they, you know, do they act as 
Is it really more filters? Is it more you're using it for timing? Are you, do they play an equal weight or kind of general process on how you put it all together? Because the challenge for so many of these different considerations is how much weight do you put upon them? How is it, how long is the play out? So maybe just talk a little bit about the process in general of how it all works together. Sure. The first thing we do is valuation work. And We don't, in our valuation work, think about fundamental proxies like P.E. ratios, price-book ratios, ratios, PEG ratios, things like that. What we're focusing on is the present value of future cash flows. Literally, we will look at the S&P 500 just as an analyst in the equity space would look at an individual company. Think of it as a company with 500 subsidiaries all being brought together. The information that we use for that discounted cash flow modeling, cash flow, or speaking first about cash flows, come from macro data. We are looking at a national income and product count information. We're looking at policies associated with rule of law, regulation, property rights, et cetera, that can influence the overall growth in the longer term horizon from things like this. As we come back more to kind of the clear and present universe, we will consider things such as Macron being elected as the president in France and what policies he's implementing. And for example, his battle with the railway union right now is a very important policy consideration. Those are the types of things we look at. We're not aggregating up company by company, and we're not taking external estimates of of cash flows or anything like that. It's all trying to introduce a completely different, purely macro focus on it. The discount rate comes from our own covariance structure. We're literally creating an equilibrium covariance matrix that has a horizon looking out about, say, 30, 40 years, kind of an equilibrium state of risk over the longer term. And that defines for us what the discount rate we'll use for the longer term cash flows. Obviously, we'll start with where the risk premium is today and migrate to that. But the key is purely macro in the numerator. In the denominator, it is our thought about long-term risk, not based on historical data, uh, informed by historical data, but purely forward-looking in nature. When we discount all those cash flows, and we have estimates of value across the board, we then compare prices to values. And some things are priced at fundamental value, some things are priced below fundamental value, we wanna buy those. Some things are priced below fundamental value, I'm sorry, we want it priced below fundamental value, we wanna buy those. Above fundamental value, we wanna sell those. That's the starting point of all of this. We won't go against fundamental value. There might be a lot of other considerations going on out there. But if price is below fundamental value, we're going to be long. We don't want to be short something that is cheap just because of a short-term development. Similarly, if it's priced above fundamental value, we want to be short. We're going to be consistent with that price to fundamental value discrepancy and what that tells us in terms of being long or short. Once we've done that, we refer to that as the where stage of the process. Where are there opportunities? The next stage of the process is why. Why do those mispricings actually exist? Sometimes they exist for good reasons, sometimes not. Sometimes we don't have a clue. But the key is to now delve in and say, why do those discrepancies actually exist? And that's where we begin to use the macro thematic analysis that we have. We have the game theory analysis that we have. We have a framework as well for delving into what is actually already priced into the market. I'm very framework oriented here in terms of doing this. And then lastly, we have the only one that's purely data driven, purely quant driven is a, an assessment of turbulence or how fragile is the market at any point in time. And that it then is our ability to understand why prices may deviate from fundamental values. If we can't really get anything, we'll just go with what fundamental values suggest. What we're looking at here in the why aspect is timing and magnitude. Do we want to go now, wait later in terms of a strategy change, or do we want to be larger than than our signals would suggest or smaller than our signals would suggest? Finally, we have an interesting approach to risk 
We actually use the macro thematic factors, the game theaters, and other considerations to bend, literally bend that equilibrium covariance matrix to be not 30, 40 years, but to be anywhere from now to about two years, the investment horizon that we have looking forward from now. And we use those factors, the game theaters, to actually bend that covariance matrix to say, what are we actually investing through today? In the end, when it comes to actually setting the strategy, we use expected returns that are determined by price converging on fundamental value, also determined by the macro thematic analysis, the game theoretical analysis, the conventional wisdom analysis, and our fragility analysis. All those come together to identify the expected returns. We then adjust those based on what edge we believe we have in the market. Do we believe we have information that is very valuable, not very valuable, we feel confident in, and we have a scaling. The more confident we are, the better we feel about the analysis, the more willing we are to respond in full or more than full to that that signal. The next thing we do is we adjust the signals by risk. So we basically take the the expected return times our assessment of confidence, and then we haircut that or cut that based on the covariance contribution that it brings to the portfolio. And those are the signals that we actually use to make our decisions and to size our strategy. We don't run optimizations. We do not run optimizations. I don't believe in optimizations. There are a lot of corner solutions. There's a lot of constraints that people impose because they don't want something to be above 5% or whatever the limit they have. And that causes really kind of odd outcomes. Plus, the portfolios can jump quite significantly for minor changes in expected returns or in volatilities. That's not stable. An optimization tells you the trade-off between return and risk today. It doesn't tell you how much risk to take. It doesn't tell you what return you will necessarily get until you identify that risk or how much risk you have to take to get the return that you want. But the most important thing is it helps. It doesn't help you at all in terms of longitudinal risk taking. We need to make sure that we are longitudinally consistent in our response to our analysis with our strategy. And that's why we kind of created this approach that we call valuation-based allocation that looks at the expected returns, the confidence, the variance contribution, and make our decisions based on that. And those positions ultimately are proportional to those, uh, kind of close to proportional to those uh, uh, adjusted signals that, that we're looking at. In some sense, it boils down to marginal contribution to return, marginal contribution to risk. It's very close to that, but it's not prone to corner solutions or or other such crazy things. That's a great overview. And as I kind of look at your portfolio, and this may be outdated, so correct me, please, if I'm wrong, you know, kind of leads you down this this windy road where you, where you end up. And, and it looks like we'll get to currencies later, but if you're looking at kind of equities and fixed income, it seems like, you know, you have some long and short exposures where You know, U.S. and Canada may be some slight short exposure, but longer exposure to Europe and and U.K. and emerging. And then a lot of fixed income, maybe maybe even straight short. Maybe talk a little bit about kind of the positioning now and kind of the thesis behind that sort of portfolio, if if it's even accurate and up to date. Sure. Uh, It's sufficiently up to date. I can qualify the things that don't really may not be quite as up to date. Uh, Generally speaking, I would say that we are taking below signal equity positions and below signal bond positions. We're not as short as our signals would fully suggest in bonds. We're not as long as our signals would suggest in the equity space. Now, if we drill down, and that's consistent with the valuation in terms of being long equities and short bonds, it's just a muted or a more cautious strategy. And I'll get into why. There are four really important concerns that we have that do lead us to to be more cautious in the portfolio. Uh, The U.S. basically uh, roughly flat in the portfolio. It's a situation where in the U.S. prices have gone up. It's kind of been the safest of the risky asset classes that uh, central banks have pushed investors toward. Uh, It seems to have gotten a good bid from that over the last several years and pushed prices higher. And that 
in turn has ultimately led to it being priced a little bit above fundamental value. Similarly, with uh, not for the same reasons, but Canada is attractive on a fundamental basis. That's the primary consideration. There are other financial and energy considerations there, but th- that's secondary. Where we do see the opportunities the most are actually, well, I should say the other one is that we're, where we kind of look at it and say markets are attractive. I would not include the U.S., Canada, or Japan in those. Those are the ones I would look at and say they're not really attractive across equities. What is attractive across equities is emerging markets and some of the European, as you mentioned, some of the European markets. And in particular, when we look at emerging markets, the things that we look at as being attractive, we put Greece in the emerging market uh, category for us, are Greece, Brazil, Argentina, luckily for us today, and uh, our, you know, whatever it is, last week, um, and India, and to a lesser degree, China, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So the top ones really are, when we look at our Greece, Brazil, and India, and then secondarily, China, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And that's excluding any currency. Think of these as being evaluated on a currency-hedged basis. When we come to to Europe, it's really kind of the peripheral ones that look good. I already mentioned Greece, but we include that in emerging markets. But also Italy and Spain are important in terms of uh, investment opportunity. There's been a lot of uncertainty associated with those markets. I think that uncertainty has ultimately led to attractive opportunities that investors haven't taken advantage of. We also see the UK as attractive. Clearly, Brexit is a concern for the marketplace, and it has, from our perspective, we believe, uh, led to investors shying away from that market. We look at it and say, yeah, that's probably true, but that doesn't ultimately mean that it's fundamentally warranted. And in terms of our uh, game theory analysis of the negotiations between the UK and Europe, our sense was that we would spend about a year going through a a relatively eventless environment. We're coming to the end of that year. Our sense is also that the players have an an ultimate incentive. We go through backward induction here, but an ultimate incentive to extend the negotiating horizon. That's where we we're, we're looking at it. In that sense, we're less frightened of of the UK than the market is. Our, our assumption is that the risk that we're being exposed to is less than the overall risk that the market is is pricing in. So the UK is one of the ones that that looks attractive to us. As we go to bonds. The bond space, generally speaking, with central bank manipulation of interest rates, pushing them lower. In the bond space, most bond markets are unattractive. Among the ones that are more attractive, the U.S. were basically flat. Uh, That's an, an interesting opportunity. It's about one of the more interesting ones now that rates are a little bit higher here, and that boosts the coupon income, which is a primary driver ultimately over the longer horizon of a fundamental investor. Uh, But we are quite happy to be short some of the bond markets right now. We're short Germany uh, against the U.S. position that we have in the portfolio. In investment grade, we are looking at that and saying it's, or credit, I should say, the investment grade is somewhat attractive in the U.S. Uh, That's in part relative to the U.S. equity market being not necessarily so attractive. And then high yield, we're looking at that and saying uh, it's not very attractive at all. And when we look at those, we're looking at the spread, basically the OAS or the option adjusted spread that we're valuing there, not the underlying sovereign interest rate below that. And that's where we look at it and say investment grade is okay and high yield is not attractive really at all. Interesting. And so how often are you guys changing this? Is this something that you're kind of trading every day or every week? Or is this more of like you you kind of are making adjustments quarterly? Is it something where you close your eyes and blink and do it once a year? Like is it a kind of con- consistent, constant process? Or how are you guys kind of monitoring and adjusting uh, the portfolio? It's a continual process with no specified frequency. We'll respond to signals as those signals change. We will respond to our analysis as the analysis evolves. And that could be today, it could be not for another two months that we might do a transaction. 
On average, I would say we're probably looking at around three or four transactions a month that we end up putting in place. If markets aren't very volatile, we won't be doing much at all because price value discrepancies won't be changing much at all. It'll be purely driven by other analysis. The more volatile markets are, the more active we'll tend to be uh, as we respond to those changing price value discrepancies that we see in the marketplace. I want to tell you a little more about Inspirato. Listen, you only get a few days off each year to spend with the people who are special to you. Aren't these days too important to be left to chance? That's where Inspirato comes in, with luxury vacation homes across the U.S., Caribbean, Europe, and beyond. These spacious homes are staffed like five-star hotels, so you get all the amenities, an on-site concierge, and daily housekeeping, and they even do the dishes for you. That's why I became an Inspirato member. You can travel all over the world and get the same luxurious experience whether you're in Nantucket, Sonoma, Spain, or anywhere else. Y'all know I'm a skier, so I can't wait to check out their ski homes in Colorado and Montana. Members also get access to their Jaunt program, which offers incredible savings on luxury vacation homes in thousands of four- and five-star hotels around the globe, which is great for a business traveler like me. Let Inspirato take care of the details so you can focus on making the most of your vacation. Right now, our listeners can get a 1000 bucks toward their first trip to one of their exclusive vacation homes when they become an Inspirato member. Call 310-773-9474 and mention MebFavor or visit inspirato.com forward slash Meb sent me to learn more. That's inspirato.com forward slash Meb sent me. And now back to the show. So the kind of last bucket of, and in addition to cash, but a last bucket that is one of my personal favorites, but for whatever reason causes most investors, particularly in the US, less so abroad, I think, to short circuit as currencies. And it's a subject that I feel like it's really confusing for a lot of investors and often for many investors not included as an asset class or as a distinct really allocation. Rather, they simply say, okay, do I hedge, do I hedge my stocks? Do I hedge my stocks for currencies, my foreign stocks for currencies? Do I hedge my foreign bonds for currencies? And that's to the extent that they think about it at all. Maybe talk a little bit about how you guys think about currencies and your approach, because I know you guys take both a long and short approach to currencies all around the world. Sure. Yeah. I think when we consider what most investors do, they'll look at it and say, well, over time, currencies go up, they go down, but they don't really have a net impact. And for that reason, they'll choose not to hedge it. They'll just have an unhedged position in markets around the world. The flip side of that is it's a risk that It may not be compensated, but it's just one that we don't want to introduce into the portfolio, and they'll hedge it all the way back to the base currency. From our perspective, since we're unique in separating those decisions, the market decision and the actual currency decision, what we do in evaluating currencies is we'll actually evaluate an investment in cash in any country around the world that incorp- that what that means is we're putting the carry as part of our fundamental analysis of the currency opportunity and on top of that we're looking at the movement of the exchange rate toward purchasing power parity so that's the important thing here most people even academics will say that you cannot invest in currencies on a fundamental basis it has to be more systematic or technical in nature. We've had two decades of of the most consistent contribution to performance coming from currencies. And the reason is, in our empirical analysis, and consistent in my mind with what you would expect to happen on on a theoretical basis, the exchange rate converges on purchasing power parity across all currencies faster than asset prices converge to fundamental values. In our minds, in our empirical analysis, prices converge on fundamental values over an eight to 10 year period. Currencies converge on purchasing power parity over the course of four to five years, about half the time that we're looking at there. And so listeners, you know, purchasing power parity is simply a very basic measure of valuation where the famous economist example was the the Big Mac index and they have the prices of a Big Mac all around the world and how much it costs in Japan versus the US. But really, it's the cost of goods and services. You compare them 
adjust for inflation, all the other good stuff. And Brian, where does that kind of, what does that spit out for the currencies today? Are there any that you think are particularly undervalued? Any you think are particularly overvalued? Yes, uh, absolutely. In terms of portfolio positioning, it's interesting that we take the same amount of active risk for currencies as we do for assets. And the reason is, at that faster convergence period. There's uh, less breadth in the 30 currencies that we're looking at than in the overall 100 markets that or asset categories that we look at. But at the same time, while there's less, less breadth, we would say that the information coefficient of the IC is higher because of the faster convergence. When we look at that, the currencies that kind of provide some interest for us are the Singapore dollar, in no particular order here as I'm going through it, the Mexican peso, the Swedish krona, the Indian rupee, uh, rupiah, and uh, the Russian ruble. And then lastly, we look at uh, the Philippine peso and the Turkish lira. Those are the ones that we see attractive. And those are the ones we'll have positions at this point uh, between 10 and 15% uh, long positions for some of those. And then if we look at the unattractive currencies, the dollar itself is somewhat unattractive. What that means is not unattractive to itself. It's unattractive to all of the other currencies that are out there. The euro is unattractive from our perspective. What else would we generally shy away from? The Swiss franc is unattractive for us. And then if we kind of come across the board, some of the uh, commodity-based currencies such as the New Zealand dollar, a little bit in the Australian dollar. Those are ones that we look at and say we'd like to be short. The Thai baht is another significantly expensive one. It's probably the most expensive one out there. And then uh, the Israeli shekel is one that we're short as well. Those are the kind of larger positions. Those are the larger signals that we have in the portfolio, plus, generally speaking, the larger positions we have in the portfolio. The most expensive currency, the Thai baht, among the most of uh, the cheapest currencies, the Philippine peso and the Turkish lira. I love it. Currencies has always been a really near and dear to our hearts here. I, we, we wrote a currency piece many years ago, and of all the funds we've launched, the one from five, six years ago that we never launched was the currency strategies. Because <laughs> in my back of my head, I didn't think that any investors we talked to either cared or wanted it. But to me, it's one of the old school classic macro factors that if done right, can add a wonderful source of non-correlated returns to a portfolio. So, you know, as we look at your portfolio, and we actually, from our positioning, agree on many things, what kind of keeps you up at night? You know, as you look around the world, we've just exited this period, February, the last month or two, notwithstanding, but really, I mean, we had 15 up months in a row in the US stock market, one of the lowest volatility periods really in history which I kind of venture that almost no investor, if you go back to the election of Donald Trump, would have, would have predicted, certainly in last year. What, what keeps you up at night as we look towards the future? What, what kind of concerns that you have and makes you, uh, makes you nervous when you look around the world today? Yeah, there are really four major concerns that I have that do keep me up at night, probably more than they should, but they do keep me up at night. In this order of importance, the most important monetary policy, and I'll come back and discuss that a little bit. The second is rules-based strategies, such as smart beta, for example. Not that smart beta is necessarily bad, but in aggregate, it creates a concern. The third is the Volcker rule. And the fourth is circuit breaker and consistency. Now, let's start with the most important one, monetary policy. Basically, uh, if you look back at the past four decades, you see four things happening. It's kind of like Mr. Market writes a novel, and the novel in the 80s said something, and then it was rewritten in the 90s, and but effectively the same plot, rewritten in the noughties, effectively the same plot and rewritten in this decade. And the only difference is it's the same plot, but the last chapter hasn't been written yet. And if I look back then at the 80s, what was going on in in the 80s? And we've looked very closely at whether monetary policy was stimulative or restrictive and using interest rates relative to the Taylor rule, monetary aggregate growth, broader interest rates in general. Those are the types of things we looked at to characterize it. And what we found is that 
And in the case of the 80s, the Plaza Accord was when there was a significant uh, strength in the dollar. And the Plaza Accord was where uh, a number of countries got together uh, to try to halt that strength in the dollar. And in doing so, they actually then became stimulative. The U.S. became relatively stimulus, pushed the dollar lower. It went much lower. It went down about 45%. It was too much of a good thing. And then we had the Louvre Accord, which was the same bunch of countries getting together and saying, oh, it's gone down too much. Let's reverse all of that. What that meant was beginning in 85, you had a stimulative monetary policy up until the Louvre Accord in early 1987, when things began to, to, to reverse. What were the primary characteristics of that? One, there was low, relatively low volatility in the market. When you observe stimulative monetary policy, sustained stimulative monetary policy, it happens to go with, for good reason, low volatility. The other thing it happens to go with, again, sustained monetary policy, not this month's monetary policy or anything short term, sustained monetary policy is higher real returns. So you end up getting two things, low volatility, higher real returns. The other thing is that ultimately it leads to some form of mispricing in the marketplace, a bubble in some instances. And what we got from that was in October of 1987, Black Monday, when the S&P 500 dropped a little over 20% in a day. Now, we had the monetary policy influence, but there was a important consideration at the time, and that was portfolio insurance. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are old enough to, to remember that, but portfolio insurance was created and mostly sold by uh, by Leland O'Brien Rubenstein, or LOR, and what it was was, in effect, replicating a strategy with your portfolio such that if the market went down or your portfolio went down, they would sell out of the portfolio and Let's say the market went down by 15%. By the time it got down 15%, the idea was to sell basically all of it out. So you're limiting the downside by selling when the market goes down and buying when the market goes up. Well, when the market started selling off, these were contractual obligations to sell. And portfolio insurance hit the market and hit it hard because they did not have any discretion to do anything but sell in response to the decline. And that really exacerbated the decline that we got in 87, compressing a lot of it into one day. Their market was down more than that, but it didn't last for long in that instance. The stimulus didn't last long. And the ultimate correction didn't last that long. It was very deep, but it didn't last that long. And portfolio insurance was important. Portfolio insurance at the time was thought to be about 3% of the market cap. So it wasn't a big thing, but it was definitely big enough to have a huge influence. Then we go into from the 80s into the 90s, I mean, in the 90s. The 90s was another period that was when Alan Greenspan, after the 87 crash, demonstrating the Greenspan put, as it was called, by basically stimulating aggressively when the market uh, fell, the market began to feel that the Federal Reserve was had their backs in all of this and pursued a stimulative monetary policy, the Federal Reserve did, and that was the time when Greenspan bought into the new era of productivity through investment technology. And that was when he basically, the idea there was, since he bought into it, the economy through productivity would be growing faster. If that were happening, he would be wanting to accommodate it with more money in the system. And that's what he did. And we had several years of stimulative monetary policy. And that led to ultimately the tech bubble, the dot-com bubble that ultimately burst in the first quarter, began bursting in the first quarter of 2000 on and continued on through the summer of 2002. Again, what did we observe? As you already noted, a long period, a long stretch, and it's the longest stretch I can ever remember of low volatility, where it just hovered in the equity markets around 10%. It would normally hover, let's say, around 15%. It hovered around 10% for, for several years. The other thing was an appreciation of capital markets over that period of time, a significant real return on equities. Ultimately, however, 
that dot com or IT bubble that emerged from the stimulus burst, and we ended up with another significant market decline. I believe the NASDAQ declined something like uh, 70%. The S&P declined a lot. But there was not just the U.S. There was a newer market index, it was called, in Germany uh, that basically declined by 90% and became defunct after all of that. But it was the same thing. Stimulus, low volatility, high real returns, and a reckoning at the end of that. Then we come into the noughties. When we get to the noughties, we again have a stimulative monetary policy, some of that coming out of defense against the crash that had the same type of influence in terms of of low volatility and uh, higher real returns. It was mostly a bubble that was reflected in, in real estate. And ultimately, that bubble burst. That bubble bursting was exacerbated by subprime security issuance that was uh, uh, quite interesting, complicated, unique, and not really making any money for anybody but the people selling them. And that unwound quite uh, aggressively, and that unwinding was the global financial crisis. In that instance, that was what I think we best refer to as a leverage crisis. And real estate dropped, but leverage, the deleveraging uh, across the industry, especially the financial sector, that kind of brought everything to a, to a halt. The, the financial sector basically stopped functioning and the market collapsed in that. Again, the same story. Easy monetary policy, low volatility, high real returns, a day of reckoning. Now what do we have? We have now gone through this decade and each of these periods of stimulus get longer and longer and longer and ultimately the reckoning is getting more and more difficult (laughs) in many instances but now what we're seeing is a long period of stimulative monetary policy not just in the u.s but around the world the ecb the bank of england the bank of japan and through currency tie the people's bank of china it is an amazing amount of stimulus that's going into the system. It's been a nice bull market, especially in the U.S. And it's our view that the bubble that we see is in bonds and in illiquid assets, such as private equity, infrastructure, and private debt. We haven't, however, seen the flip side of that, which is as rates begin to rise and the reckoning day of reckoning comes on around. That's the the kind of the monetary, underlying monetary driver of of concern. And that's the primary concern that we have. The problem is, like 87, with portfolio insurance, we now have a plethora of smart beta and risk parity and systematic quantitative strategies that are somewhat or completely rule-based. Smart beta, completely rule-based packaged as ETFs often, they have to be completely real based to be packaged as an ETF. They have to be the equivalent of an index like the S&P 500. Its rules are invest only in the U.S., not outside the U.S., invest only large cap, not in small cap or mid cap. That's its set of rules. But there's now high dividend, low vol, low beta, any number of different uh, rules that are used to create these various strategies. And there's a lot of overlap in securities that they buy, sometimes high dividend or also low volatility. And both of those different rules-based strategies will buy into it. So there's a concentration of flow into some sectors and into some securities out there in particular. The problem is, like portfolio insurance, they're contractually obligated to transact when there is selling. The shares outstanding begin to decline. There is nothing they can do but sell, just like portfolio insurance did back in 87. It doesn't cause a crash. It exacerbates any type of decline that may occur. If we begin to look at things like systematic quantitative portfolios, our observation is a lot of those portfolios are data mining the same set of factors first identified often by academics from a French three-factor model was one of the earlier ones and it blew up in the past. 
we now have systematic strategies identifying the same types of things. And even in early in the first quarter when the market declined, even the AI machine learning strategies went down with the systematic strategies, basically indicating that they're all kind of piling on to a, a consistent set of, of factors. It's not anywhere near as rule-based as something like smart beta, but there still is a pattern of behavior there that is somewhat rule-based driven by the a quantitative model. The less flexible the quantitative model, the more rule-based it may be. And the last is something like risk parity, which isn't necessarily rule-based per se, and there's wide variation in in risk parity from Bridgewater, for example, Ray Dalio's operation, uh, Cliff Asness and uh, his operation. But there's now, there, there, Johnny come lately is all over the place in, in risk parity. And the thing is, we if we kind of add those up, depending on how much uh, rule-based versus flexibility you count, in our mind, we're looking at something around 6 or 7% of the marketplace, of, of the capital market, is in the equity space now rule-based driven strategies. And I'm excluding the broad, passive, purely passive uh, index-based strategies like the S&P 500 or the, the NASDAQ or something like that. These, when they begin to sell through share out, shares outstanding declining in a bear market, they have no choice. It's rule-based. It's driven. The big concern in risk parity is the correlation between stocks and bonds going up and forcing an overall deleverage out of those players. That's the real concern with risk parity in this regard. So the rule-based strategies now create an environment like the environment we had in 87 with portfolio insurance that can su significantly exacerbate any downturn in the market. The third one is the Volcker rule. Bottom line, that gets easy, each get easier and easier to tell. Uh, the Volcker rule is basically taken away investment banks' ability to inventory. In the absence of inventory, they cannot fill a function that they have filled for decades prior to the Volcker rule. Prior to that, an investment bank could expand or contract its balance sheet and took advantage of crises to step in and buy. And often you can think of it as a pseudo obligation to buy, uh, such as your primary dealer. As a primary dealer, you get information in advance. The quid pro quo is that you are providing that liquidity to the marketplace when it's necessary. Similarly, similarly in the equity space, that's gone. They can't expand and contract their balance sheets anymore. They can't inventory. What they become then is middlemen passing the securities that they take on to other players. Often that proves to be high frequency traders. What we see from that is a collapse in the size of transactions. There's you know, much, much fewer of these 50,000 block trades and much, much more of getting your fill and finding out you've got a thousand trades at the end of the day of tiny little pieces to execute what you need done. The markets are paper thin, especially in the corporate bond market. They are absolutely paper thin uh, markets. We don't know where lo the liquidity is going to come from in the event of a market decline, a significant crisis market decline. We just haven't experienced anything like this before, really. You kind of have to uh, go back to the separation of investment and retail banking years ago, but we don't really have an experience. We don't know uh, what the liquidity is going to be. There's no obligation whatsoever that high-frequency traders have to step in, and they can turn off their activities on a dime like they did in August of 2015, a couple weeks after the China devaluation. That was a good example of it. Next and final issue are circuit breakers. Circuit breakers came into existence after and in response to the Black Monday 1987 market crash. The idea was to pause the markets for a brief period of time after a significant decline so that investors could gather information and make informed decisions. Now, with each crisis, we've gotten new layers of, of circuit breakers. We have stock-specific circuit breakers or trading halts. We have market-wide system breakers and trading halts. Uh, we have, however, and those are different. Now you've got ETFs out there that are both market indices and individual stocks. So they kind of trade in both, in both camps to some degree. The second thing is, if you look at exchanges all around the world, they all have different circuit breaker rules. 
What does that mean? Circuit breakers cause what's known as a magnet effect and what's known as a spillover effect. The magnet effect is that when the market goes down and begins to approach the circuit breaker, it attracts, it's a magnet for other sellers to come in who wouldn't otherwise come in to make sure that they get it out before that circuit breaker's hit. The spillover effect is identifiable, and it's even much, much, much bigger issue on the second circuit breaker. So it stopped once, it then opens and goes down some more. That really, really attracts uh, other sellers in there. In the U.S., these circuit breakers hit in at down 7%, down 13%, and down 20%. Again, these are different across markets around the world. The second effect of all of these is what's known as a spillover effect. Basically, it's like water going over a cliff. Ultimately, it's going to get to the bottom. It's going to find a way to to get to the river below. And if it comes down and it hits a flat space, it's going to hit it. It'll travel all the way to the side till it finds another place that it can go down and it goes down and the waterfall just spreads out and goes down. Well, if you can't sell what you want to sell or need to sell to reduce your risk, then you're going to go someplace else to do it. The next best alternative. And that could be another country's market. It could be any number of things, but it causes the crisis to be much broader than it otherwise would be. So you add up the monetary policy, the rules-based strategies, the Volcker rule, and these circuit breaker issues. It's when you combine all, all four of those concerns that that's the thing that keeps us up at night. We don't know what will trigger ultimately the decline. Who knows? But when it happens, our fear is that it's, it's sharper and deeper than investors would otherwise expect. After hearing that, I don't know how you get any sleep at night at all. <laughs> it sounds like, <laughs> sounds like you made a wonderful case for our new uh, sales pitch for our new tail risk ETF we have. Anyway, so <laughs> it's interesting because catalysts are tough. And looking back on markets in, in historical bear markets, you know, the, a lot of the catalysts are easily identifiable in retrospect where you can say, well, you know, like the housing leverage in 2007 and everything else going on then and go back to the 90s, you know, it's always a little harder in real time. And so you mentioned, you know, the exact turning points is is tough to pick. So what, what can people do about it? What's like the takeaway? You know, is it something where you think there's there's any tools to address this? Is it to try to be, you know, kind of mind, just mindful about it and be potentially have some hedges or some reduced expo- what, what, what's What's the general tools that you can kind of address these challenges? It's interesting. And I agree with you. I actually have the belief and communicate strongly that catalysts, that we, we don't try to identify catalysts. We stay away from it. I don't believe it's feasible. And often you can go back and point to something after the fact. But let's face it, who in the world Who in the world, anybody, you got 7 billion, 8 billion people out there, who in the world actually predicted that a Tunisian street vendor immolating himself in the street would ultimately lead to Arab Spring? Nobody. Nobody. The point is the environment was such that that catalyst could actually occur. And from our perspective, what we're looking for is environments that are susceptible to that type of thing. We believe we are in an environment now, not necessarily, doesn't mean anything's going to happen. It's just an environment and nothing may happen for a year. Nothing may happen for two years. It may happen tomorrow. We just don't know. And that's what we're looking for in terms of risk management is, is are we in that environment When we're in that environment, we're more cautious with the portfolio. I mentioned that our securities are somewhat more dampened and our beta exposure is somewhat more dampened than it would otherwise be. And the fragility analysis that we do is part and parcel of this, where we can kind of measure shorter term ups and downs and vulnerability that we see in in the marketplace. So we are more cautious in the portfolio. The second thing we do is think about the concept of client threatening risk. When I got into the industry, unfortunately, about almost 40 years ago, (laughs) there was, even through the 90s, as a multi-asset investor, I would always get asked about diversification. And, And back in the 80s and 90s, Uh, diversification meant what new asset classes and what new countries can you put me into? High yield, emerging market debt, 
frontier markets, any of those things. Now I'm asked about diversification. Nobody wants diversification in a bull market. Nobody. They want exact exposure, full exposure to that market. They want diversification only in a down market. It's just another way of saying downside protection. And downside protection has gotten to be a primary focus of investors today around the world, not just in the U.S. And the question is, how do they invest for that? And you see that many of the standard tools you would use for managing downside, such as buying put options, are very expensive, very expensive to do because there is a large demand for those things. The SKU in the option portfolio is not a SKU as much anymore as it is a SMERC where the calls are at the money and, and then higher strike prices are relatively flat in terms of implied volatility and those implied volatilities shoot up when you get strike prices below uh, the current market price. And it's just not feasible to sit around there and buy insurance through these options. You've got to come up with other ways of doing it. And what we do is think of client threatening downside. That means that we're okay taking the first 10% of the down. We're less okay with taking the next 10 or 20% of the down. And two, we need to find other ways of actually implementing it that aren't so costly, such as sector strategies that are more convex in nature, that actually perform well on a down market, or alternatively, shorting securities that are held by a lot of these rule-based strategies so that we can be a liquidity provider when that type of sell-off occurs and forces these rules-based strategies to act. There's going to be demand for liquidity. It's going to be hard to get. We, that's when we want to be in, a, in the case of providing downside liquidity. But that only happens when the market drops a lot. You know, 5%, nobody really cares to any great degree. But as it drops more than that, then you begin to have that happen and you begin to have investors seeking liquidity in exactly the securities they had been buying before. They're trying to sell them. We want to be in the, in the business of providing that liquidity. So those are the types of things we're doing in this environment where you know we're not sleeping at night. Our job is to take risk, not to eliminate risk. We have to take compensated risk and we have to calibrate how much downside risk we're willing to take how much we need to offset and how much we're willing to pay for it. And it's gotten to be a complex game out there. And some of the strategies are, are relatively interesting and unique, unique, but it's kind of what we have to do. And one, one of the things we didn't really touch on today was the strategic role you kind of see of cash in a portfolio. And I know you guys have a bucket allocated to cash as well. Maybe maybe talk briefly about that. And I'm, I've already held you for longer than I'm supposed to, but I got a couple more quick questions to tack on. But maybe talk to the role of cash in a portfolio as well. Just out of the shoe, we do go long and short. Therefore, our gross exposure is, is higher than our net exposure. However, we don't use financial leverage in a portfolio. We have cash in the portfolio, and uh, I, it could be negative, I guess, but that's not, generally speaking, a, a, a what we would want in the portfolio. We'd stay away from that type of pure financial leverage, but we are willing to hold cash. We're basically agnostic to cash. Agnostic to cash in the sense that when you're investing long short, there are many ways to offset risk. In our instance, what are we doing? Well, we basically have no position in, in bonds. And because we don't want to own further out on the curve. That's, that's a risk we don't want to take. What does that mean? Well, when we buy equities, there's only one place to basically think about financing that is you've got to begin to go short the bond space. And over time, because we're cautious, we have cash in the portfolio. We're happy to have cash as a downside risk management tool. It's all about managing the beta. And we have an average beta that we would expect over time. When we want to be below that, we'll tend to have more cash in the portfolio. When we want to be above that normal beta, we'll tend to have less cash in the portfolio. Right now, we tend to have more cash in the portfolio because we're managing the beta a little on the low side, not dramatically on the low side, but a little on the low side. Thus, cash is an incredibly important element of the portfolio, but it's really driven by 
all of the things, considerations that we have with the risky asset portion of the portfolio. And in that sense, it becomes an outcome more than it becomes a uh, direct decision. But if we were to make a direct decision, it would be exactly the same decision. And it's an important asset class for us in the portfolio. Quick Twitter questions, since we asked on Twitter to ask any questions in Got a handful of questions about bonds, and the gist of most of the questions were this: said, "Do you think we'll ever see ten-year yields get back to four to five percent? And basically, what would what would it take, or what sort of yields would it take for you guys to get really bullish on kind of U.S. Treasuries as well? And you know, there's about four different flavors of this question: is like, where are we in the bond cycle? Are rates going to continue up? You know, all, all those sort of things, but." If you could kind of play out, what would make bonds look really attractive to you? Is there a level? Do you think they'll get there? Do you think we're range bound? Do you think rates will go back down to 1%? What's a, if, if you had to put your forecasting, prognosticating hat on, what's kind of your thoughts? It's an excellent question on bonds. Yes, I do think we'll get back to 4 to 5%. Why do I think we'll get back to 4 to 5%? Well, let's take, go back and t- think about the components. The first is the real risk-free rate. The real risk-free rate has averaged over the last century right around 1.5% to 2%. Sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's much higher. But if you think about that equilibrium real risk-free rate, let's call it right around 1.5% to 2%. I'll call it 1, 1.5%. Then if we look at, for example, the 10-year and uh, look over time – at the term premium that is required and or has been experienced over the long term for that 10 year 10 year note it's about a percent so now you've got one and a half percent real risk-free rate add a percent on it you've got two and a half percent that you're working with now what's the inflation that you're thinking about well typically we're thinking about two percent because that's what the fed seems to want to target over time now you add two percent to that two and a half percent where are you four and a half percent. In my mind, that's the equilibrium state of affairs as long as we're shooting for a 2% inflation rate here in the U.S. Now, the question is, what would cause us to act in some way, either selling or buying treasuries in the U.S.? Well, first, we believe that central banks will tend to step in and support risky asset prices if they begin to decline. Why is that the case? After the global financial crisis, central banks explicitly stepped in and pushed investors from riskless and low-risk assets to higher-risk assets such as equities. They brought that term structure down. In in the case of Japan and and Europe, they basically brought it to, to flat at zero or a little bit below zero. And the only alternative then is what investors have done, uh, which is to come up with crazy ideas like volatility selling and alternatively investing in risky assets. And in particular, I think one of the areas of of more risky assets that are problematic in terms of a bubble are the illiquid ones, as I mentioned, private equity, infrastructure, private debt, for example. The thing is, if that's what they're going to do, their ability to raise interest rates is limited by the market's response to those increases in rates. And they're able to do it to the degree that the market doesn't ultimately begin to go down, respond negatively, like it did with the first taper tantrum announcement. That means for us that rates are likely to rise slower than what the market generally expects. And that's an important aspect of it. So for thinking about getting long the market, it's really the case that, yeah, we've got a low coupon, have a relatively slow increase in interest rates. Uh, so we're not looking at a big capital loss there. It's a minor gain. It's a minor gain in the portfolio. And it's generally better in the U.S. than we see outside the U.S. where there are negative interest rates. In terms of selling, yes, rates are going up to 4.5%, give or take. Are we going to short it? Well, you, we got to have a view that is different from what's already priced into the market. If we see what's priced into the market and some other considerations in place, we may be better off simply rolling uh, shorter term instruments, let's say a one-year T-bill over time and capturing that slow rise in rates by bringing up the income portion of it. What would it take? It would take for us a significant indication of change in Fed policy. 
And Jay Powell, I think, is more willing to take downside in risky assets than Yellen or Bernanke, or Greenspan for that matter. And that is one thing that does give us cause for concern. That's one thing that suggests that that rates could actually move on higher, but we don't have a view that's different from the marketplace right now. It's not substantially different from the marketplace leading us to do anything about it. So it's funny. Yeah, I think the equilibrium yield is higher. I think everybody thinks the equilibrium yield is higher, but that doesn't mean we can necessarily do a lot about it in terms of beating the market. It may be that we want to be in cash. That may be the best way to take advantage of that uh, rise in, uh, in interest rates. It may be the case that we want to be out in 10 years and collapse the capture a coupon, a higher coupon, under the assumption that the capital losses will be limited and spread out over time. And that's the better way to do it. You really have to have a different view on the path than what's already priced in the market to, to take significant advantage of that. And right now we just don't see it. You know, it's, it's such a good example. So many times we'll have investors email or call us and want to talk about Tesla or Amazon or Bitcoin or whatever. And I often tell them, I said, look, you know, it's okay not to have a strong opinion. The, the example we gave is you don't have to play. And in so many examples, everyone wants to have a strong opinion on, you know, some investment where I got to be short Tesla or got to be long something else. When you can also say, hey, you know, it's just, it's, uh, we're not playing right now, but we might at some point in the future. So I, I think that's a really important topic in investing that a lot of people get kind of sucked into playing way too many hands that they, they probably don't have an edge in. Brian, this has been awesome. I've had so much fun. We, we always ask one question at the end to all of our guests, which is if you look back into your career, um, and this can be personal or managing assets, what's been the most memorable investment or trade that you've made that kind of comes to mind? It could be great. It could be horrible. It could be anything in between. Uh, anything, uh, anything you think of? Uh, well, that's interesting. Literally, the Friday before Black Monday in 1987, I sold every single stock that I had. What was the, what was the reasoning? You just got a hunch? You felt you're going on vacation for the weekend or what? No, it's, it's interesting. In fact, there was, my brother was up visiting from Tennessee, and we were driving down Lakeshore Drive. And I said, I got to stop. I got to find a phone. I got on the phone, called my broker, and sold everything. And at the time, I was a shorter-term investor. I was on a, a bond desk trading bond derivatives at, at the time, and my perspective about the market was different than it is today. And there were so many developments in the marketplace in the week before. The, the market declined a good bit the week before, but there were so many characteristics of it. One of the biggest characteristics for a, a number of reasons, but I'll just say what the characteristic was, was that on that Friday, there was very little volume. It was just an odd day, and it suggested to me that market prices weren't at a level that would actually be clearing the market. And I thought it, I had a negative view about things, so I stepped in and took everything out of the market. And the only problem is, at the time, I didn't have any money. <laughs> So it didn't really help me that much. I need that type of thing these days. I guess I got it again, though, and uh, after the tech bubble burst, stepped in at just the right time there and, and, and bought into the market. I guess those are the, the, mo the most memorable is 87, though, mostly because I surprised myself looking back at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, if you decide to do it again, get, make sure you give us a call and, uh, or, or shoot us an email and let me know when you're uh, liquidating on a Friday in Chicago. <laughs> Brian, this, this has been a blast. What's what's the best place for people to follow your writings and research and everything uh, else if they want to if they want to follow up more? Sure. The actually, it's it's very nice that William Blair has a blog and actually a Twitter uh, feed. And generally speaking, the research that we do will be distributed through that. It's often toned down a little bit, where we may be much more academic. And it's, it's toned down to be shorter and a little bit more accessible to people. But generally speaking, the academic work is available if anybody reaches out and asks for it. We're quite transparent in everything we do. That's probably the best way to do it, or unless you happen to know somebody at, at William Blair. Great. That's perfect. You got, you're speaking to the, the audience we have. They love reading uh, that sort of material. <laughs> Brian, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And as you said, it's a ton of fun. Listeners, we'll post show note links to a lot of Brian's pieces, writings we didn't even get into 
his game theory uh, paper today, but we may have to invite him back on and talk about it again sometime in the future. As always, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Breaker, Overcast. And if you like the show, hate the show, leave us a review. We love reading them. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Good investing.